Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're welcoming back to the show Joshua Townsend. Joshua has a nature-based approach to the creative process, and he coaches and teaches pretty much anything around the creative process of storytelling. So Joshua, welcome back. Delight to be back. Thank you. Yeah. You're looking very expansive yeah. and very warm today. I love it. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I would love to hear a little bit more about what you've been up to since we last talked several months ago now. Sure. Yeah. I've been, as always, I'm working with people on projects and the projects can either be from a literary perspective where people are writing something or from a perspective of performance. So someone's going to put something forth into the world as a performer. And I helped someone that had her own one woman show for the, for a festival that was going on in LA. I'm working with this guy right now about a short film that he's been putting together for actually about nine months. And we're doing something really interesting. So I'm helping him with the narrative. And then there's a sequence, a larger sequence within the film that he wants to nail from an improvisational perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be going in and working with the actors that he casts for three or four days to build this ensemble kind of vibe feeling that a lot of actors not always have because Mm -hmm. we work in isolation. Yeah. And so really build a community, an ensemble feeling where there's give and take and people are really listening and people are really responding and having these moments. And so that's going to be a really fascinating process to go through and then see how it translates to the actual filming days and then what shows up on the final edit. Yeah, that sounds cool. I did improv for a while when I was back in San Francisco. and Yeah, fascinating, interesting. What kind of of improv did you do? The Herald, long form and it was, we did several performances and mm-hmm. I actually did it initially because I thought, well, I love improv and it's, I felt like it was some tools I would like to add to my toolbox, get a little better at that. And we would meet weekly and it was great. And always you have to be so on your toes, so present when you're yes. doing improv or you get lost really fast. Really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell what the Herald is? So, because that's a very specific reference point. Yeah. I don't know that I could actually accurately define it, but it is a long form. So you have to, we create these long stories that just go on and on Mm -hmm. and keep building. Many times in improv, they're very short short pieces. But aside from that, I don't actually remember what the specifics were about the Herald. Yeah, it's a very specific form that people use within the improv world, which is around really around stories that they're really isolating, not isolating, but they're really focusing on that. And then like you said, there's long form, short form. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And it's a language that people share. So the deeper you go down the Herald, which I think was after one of the lead improv teacher. The deeper you go, the more fun you can have because now you know the form, Mm -hmm. right? And the improv work I do is very specific in relationship to working with base elements that no matter what kind of performance work you do, it will have value. So the Harold is very specific and very, and it does bleed into other areas because I can think of some actors that I know that have the Harold down and then that's helped them in certain other areas. But I work with sound and movement. Yeah. I work with presence. I work with breathing. Really awareness. Mm-hmm. Like awareness is an endless game. Oh, yeah. In, in life. and in- It is so central. It's like attention in many ways. Although I think very slightly different. But where we put our attention changes everything. Right? Everything. Yeah. That's huge. Mm-hmm. Or if one of the things I work on is I'm working with what's in front of me. Yeah. And if I really do that on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis, which is what you're talking about, where you choose to place your attention. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is why the the insidiousness of of media can be hor- horrendous for the artists because the media can sometimes use fear. Mm-hmm. Did I say sometimes? <laughs> it can use fear and high repetition to storm watch, you know, and then I'll, what, what, huh, what? And for days, you lose days from a storm that never comes. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a whole rabbit hole. That is. Yeah. We won't, we won't even, we just cracked oh. open the door, but we'll keep going just, down. We just, what we want to talk about. We just took Focus. A, that's right. We just took a seed. Now we're going to set it aside for a moment because it's, now I'm just like super intrigued and want to go down that road. Well, we'll do that another time. I was thinking because certainly in our world, in the audiobook world, one of the things that and I think it's very prevalent in all the media right now, and that is AI, artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. So many conversations about AI. So I thought mm-hmm. it might be fun to jump down a slightly different rabbit hole, but one that that. One very much related to it, but in a specific context and frame. And that is, and it's very philosophical, but that is the rabbit hole of who we are as humans and the stories, specifically, the stories that we tell ourselves and that we tell the world around us. Now, sometimes we're writing those stories down, right? The authors were storytelling as narrators, as actors. Let's get philosophical in the and in this context. And Mm -hmm. I think of it as a frame of artificial intelligence and humanity. But what I really mean by that is like the looking at that relationship and the again, the stories that we're telling ourselves. And I know that we have we can talk about this in a couple different contexts. So let's start with. Authors, writers, the people that are generating these stories, the writers, what would you say, how would you describe the human relationship with story? Inextricable. Like it's so tightly wound to unwind it is, I don't want to say anything's impossible, really challenging to drop the story but not like in common parlance, but like really drop the story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we tell ourselves stories, right? Our inner dialogue. Yeah. We tell other people's hyper edited versions of stories that happen to us in order to lead people down a certain road of a way of seeing us or thinking of us, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We tell our story unconsciously through the clothes that we wear every day, Mm -hmm. by the foods we eat, by what we say, by what we don't say, just goes on and on and how many ways and how many layers we get involved in communicating who am I and what do I want. For AI to come in and have a relationship with that, like I was watching something about avatars and how all you have to do is change your avatar, (laughs) which is a very interesting situation. So people who say do a lot of videos. Yeah. So you create an avatar, which can be based on how you look, Mm -hmm. right? And then it's animated. And then you animate it in any style you want. And then you can make the age older, younger, different gender, alien, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And then the story that comes out of that avatar, that let's call it a character, will be very different based on the character that I choose. So if, if I choose a wise old man as my avatar then whatever I'm going to share needs to have that point of view. Yeah. If I choose the avatar of of an ingenue, a young ingenue, then it needs to have that point of view. And so in a way, this kind of AI can help expand the range of authentic point of view. So I'm not just stuck into my current state, whatever that might be. So when to clarify, so when you said they say all you have to do is change your avatar Mm -hmm. in the context of writing, is that what you mean? Or developing characters? Yeah, Yeah, in terms of developing, let's say developing a character. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing, there's different kinds of writing. But if I'm writing from a character's point of view, Mm -hmm. then I need to adopt that point of view fully. I couldn't have the same story roll out in the same and have the same impact as a wise old man as opposed to the ingenue. Couldn't. And if I did change 
if I didn't change the story, it would still land differently in the listener or the reader. So are you saying then that using AI by changing your avatar, let's say, you're going to be the wise old man. Yeah, yeah. Now we're going to hear the wise old man version of you. Yes. Like, how would we hear that? How would that play out uh, from, so if we say, okay, I have this, this conversation in this mm -hmm. text. Yeah. So tell me if I'm like, not, a, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm just guessing on what you mean, because this is new to me. Yeah. So if I have this conversation and I say, okay, this part, the, the, this character is my wise old man version of me. And this is my yeah. five-year-old girl version of me. Now yes. create this conversation and then it's going to ch change the text or what? So I, the writer, has to change the text. I have to ch not only change the text, I would say we start with point of view, how the character thinks and feels. Right. So what? How does? how is AI playing into that? What is it providing? It's making it more mutable and it's also making it more... Real is a funny word to use here, <laughs> but it makes it more real in the sense of Sometimes I work with authors and they've written something and they're portraying it like it's coming from a 10-year-old version of themselves. Yeah. And yet I know in my heart of hearts, they are taking some of their current point of view, say as a 45-year-old, and infusing it into the 10-year-old version of themselves. Right. And I can hear it, but they can't. Mm -hmm. So I feel that if I were to make an audio recording of it, mm -hmm. put it on an avatar, put it on a 10-year-old avatar so they can hear and see it. I would, and we would do playback and we go, does that sound like a 10-year-old? Is that, are you holding the perspective of a 10-year-old in real time? Oh, I see. And so then people would start to have an integration of not only the, the audio, but the visual at the same time. And I feel like coupling those together mm -hmm. will only make it more more helpful mm -hmm. for people to go deeper into the point of view. I see. Using it as more as a kind of mirror of the work that they've created so that they can see it in a different way. More of a review kind of process in a way. I'll call it developmental. So, yeah, so as you're developing it, then you're like, oh, wow, I'm not really holding a 10-year-old's point of view. Mm -hmm. And then if you still decide that you want to keep it the way it is, and good on you and see how it flow and see how it flows. Yeah. But at least then you're making a conscious choice as opposed to a default unconscious choice. Interesting. Yeah. So that's really, I feel like that's something that's really important. I feel like AI is going to, you know, that old thing, render the coin to Caesar, what's rendering to <laughs> Caesar, what under the coin or whatever, yeah. however that goes. It's like AI is going to have its place. Right. Yeah. When we had the telephone. Mm -hmm. What you're not going to use the telephone? Sure, you're still going to write letters, but you're not going to use the telephone. But they didn't replace each other. Mm -hmm. Sending someone a beautiful letter is has its has a, a very special value or email written word than someone talking to someone on the phone. Yeah, yeah. I say yes to both. Yes, although I guess I I see them as quite different because there's still methods of one human communicating with another versus. What is this artificial intelligence anyway? When it's a pulling together of what's already out there. Exactly. And that's its downfall. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. But let's go deeper. <laughs> it's, it can't, it can only resource that which is in terms of its ability to pull in information and data, right? Yeah. And if something doesn't exist, it can't pull from it because it's not there. Right. So that means that me as the creative artist, which is putting something together that's never been fused together, is still there. If I have a new thought, a new feeling of something that's never been modeled before, then I have to write it. AI can't write it because there's no reference point for it. Yeah, That's a huge distinction that I feel is being left off the table right now. Yeah. It's only going to help us be more creative or mandate that we get more creative. Right. Because we're not. Right. And we can't not accept the the new technology. So I was watching someone. Someone said something about Rembrandt's and paintings mm -hmm. and the Grand Masters. Yeah. And then photography came along in the late 1800s. <laughs> the visual artists changed in response to the new technology. Right. We're going to do the same thing. Yeah. I found it really so ironic and funny 
as I was writing out some ideas for what we would talk about today. And of course, as I'm typing, AI is like suggesting what what is I was like, stay out of it. We're going to talk about you. But this is these are my that's, notes. <laughs> that's a terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's just the suggested text. But that's AI. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where was I? I was someplace and I didn't have Internet, which means I didn't have AI. So I needed to come up with something myself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And in that moment, I went, it's the same thing. People say, oh, with a touch of a button, you can write a book. I'm like, OK, all right, let's try that. And now take that book out into the world yeah. and have interviews with people about your book. <laughs> yeah. Then what do you do? Yeah. There was So I had a conversation very recently on another episode with Matt Strain, who worked at Adobe for 17 years and was part of the team's developing AI. And his daughter is a writer. And he had shared this story with me about how she said, but dad, the same text, if you have the same paragraph, let's say, same words written by AI versus written by a human who has struggled to find the right words, they would be different. And I love that I, because I hadn't been while I've been very focused in the audiobook world on the narration part and what that that difference is and why we should not be turning that over to AI, and what we can go a little further down that in just a minute, but I hadn't thought about it in terms of the written word in that way. If the texts were identical, that they're still different. What's your take on that? Conscious creation. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it. As soon as you go into the world of conscious creation, everything changes. Yeah. Now, and so a, a consideration happened on that one word, let's just say one word, you know, what would be two words, two words that, that, that would be slightly different. And I consciously choose that word, mm -hmm. the second word, mm -hmm. as opposed to the first word. Yeah. There's a difference. You can feel it. Yeah. This is very thing that you just described, the choice of the word in any given moment is from, as an actor, has always been one of my most, uh, one of my favorite things, I'll just say it that way, is that I have a set of lines that are my character's lines. And I am recognizing that although they were written by a playwright, that the choice of words, now I could have, as a character, I could have picked defend instead of protect, but I picked yes. the word defend. And so yes. as an actor, I would, and th this was a part of not just of learning my lines, but in having them really come out of me very naturally. And um, the right word is not coming in to my mind Organic. right now, but Organically. organically, that's the right word. And was to figure out why that word is to better understand, to connect with the choice of the word. Which is exactly what you were just talking about five minutes ago about character yeah. and who am I and the stories I tell myself. Yeah. So I'm going to use your example. If the character uses the word defend as opposed to protect, yeah. the character has a narrative that runs inside of them on an unconscious level that they feel like they always need to defend themselves, Yeah. which would then tell me that they feel persecuted, right? Mm -hmm. Which would then tell me that they have a, they're stuck in a situation of you know, fight or flight. And people that are persecuted tend to go for fight as opposed to people that feel victimized and those people tend to run away. Right? Yeah. So that tells, so all, just by choosing that one word, I've gotten to a situation where I go, okay, this lady's a fighter. Yeah. But she doesn't make the first move. She only, she's a reactive fighter. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I love this. Yes. This is like the, the gold of the experience of acting for me is that just this kind of exploration and really trying to get in the shoes of that character. Yeah. Yeah. And it really comes down to, I call it state of being. So the, how the character thinks and feels and there's dominant states of beings for certain characters and to really live in it, really live it. Yeah. Because sometimes authors, writers, they'll do a thing where I can't quite hear the difference in the dialogue. Mm-hmm which means they haven't vested enough into the point of view, how the character thinks in people's. Yeah. Let's just take a short pause. We'll come back and continue the conversation. 
Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to earn more from each sale? Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify Audiobooks, a program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the sales price you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and build your community and following, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Create coupon codes or schedule a sale with promotional pricing. Amplify Audiobooks gives you the tools to effectively market your audiobooks and a much higher return on every single purchase. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com or go direct to ProAudioVoices.app. And for listeners, visit AmplifyAudiobooks.com to find your next great listen. The Amplify Audiobooks app is now available on both app stores. And now we're back. All right. Yeah. So we've talked a bunch about writing and that relationship with story. Let's shift a little bit into the narration world, the performance world. And how would you then, in terms of coming back to that question about human relationship with story, now in the context of the narrator, and we were starting to head in this direction when we left off. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? In relationship to AI and, or just in Well, let's start off with just the relationship with story and narrator and just mm-hmm. sort of filling out that picture because many of our listeners are authors. They're not in the narrative or acting world. Mm-hmm. And so I think don't, may not understand what we're really talking about. Why any, just anybody can't sit in front of a microphone and read a story. So you got a big smile on me on that one. <laughs> Yeah. So that's really interesting. So first we need to get into a a situation where we get connection. When I look at social media postings, I'm endlessly interested in the ones that are sponsored, the ones that are paid ads, Mm -hmm. and the ones that are organic. And the difference is on being on the mark. So when I've scripted a, a script for my paid posting and I've hired someone to do it for me or I'm doing it myself but I'm still paying for it to be positioned in a certain way and I pay the lighting guy and the editing person it is so on point it's unbelievable Mm. but it hits my ear in a way that I know it's they paid to get my attention as opposed to the organic which doesn't have those tells Mm -hmm. so I invite everyone to start listening and watching for that so that you can start building your sense and sensibilities around that so you can identify it as well, because it's really important. And one of the things is, which is what you just talked about, which is connection. Yeah. So the artist, the creative, the voiceover talent is actually going to go through the material and cr- if there's not a connection, create a connection to the material so that it's organic, right. so that it feels like it's coming from my I am state. And that's why not everyone can just yeah. pick up a script and read it. Yeah. This very thing is some, it's a, a piece of the puzzle, if you will, a piece of the conversation with authors of memoirs frequently. And mm-hmm. the, many times I'm talking with people and they feel like, well, it's in the first person. It's my memoir. Therefore, I guess I have to read it. And I like to, I, li- I enjoy these conversations where it's about, if you have a passion to do it, then we can help mm-hmm. you with that. But if you don't, it doesn't have to be you because of this very thing that you just talked about where you are creating that connection, stepping into mm-hmm. those shoes. Really, mm-hmm. the actor is is playing the character, being the character of mm-hmm. the author. And that the quality of that connection with the material is in essence going to be what makes or breaks the audiobook, right? It's mm-hmm. going to mm-hmm. impact the connection of the listener to the audiobook. 
and to the material. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about just memoir for a second, yeah. if the memoir was all around the current state of the person, which is not likely, but if it was, then you would have no problems because all you have to do is read it from first person point of view, where I am today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most memoirs take place over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years of life. Right. Because of that, which is what we're talking about, is that there has to be a full embodiment of that point of view as you were at 18. Right. Really hard. People think it's easy to do, really hard to do, because you have to take over that perspective, that point of view, the thoughts, the feelings, the concerns, the hopes, the dreams, all of it, because it's imbued, it'll come through in every moment of not only what you talk about, but how you talk. And this is where, coming back to the question of AI narrating audiobooks, I think is maybe a more obvious from your what you just described, how difficult it would be for artificial intelligence to be able to make that kind of adjustment. Yeah, it's challenging. Yeah. It's when, and it's new. Yeah. When I was talking with Matt Strain, one of the things that he brought up was like how incredibly complex it is just the expression of genuine surprise. We can see it. And even, honestly, genuine emotion. You know, when we're human to human, and someone is behaving in a way where maybe they're smiling and saying, I love you. And yet, you know, darn well, that's not what they mean. Or, or saying, oh, yeah, I'm definitely there for you. And, but we can sense it. We sense it as humans, one human to another. And how would you even begin to describe the complexity of that? Sure. I'll describe that complexity real fast. <laughs> When AI calls you, when a, some uh, automated situation comes in and gives you those prompts to at the bank or wherever you are on the phone, right? Yeah. Okay, so you have that experience. That's clear in your head? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you're having an engaged conversation with someone who's very close to you, romantically, family, whatever it is, but it's very close. Yeah. And then they stop talking because something emotional is coming up for them. And you know how you can feel that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That does not exist when you're on talking to AI about the bank. Right. And therein lies the difference. Yes. I love that. That it's like the tension of the silence. The, yes. The, that emotional tension of the moment. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. And it's the same thing of like what we're talking about when it comes to the word choice. When the word choice was consciously created, there's a subtle thing. These are subtle, not subtle. It's there though, it's embedded yeah. and you can feel it. And what happens is that you will have a disengagement and the whole idea of art, of creation, of story is engagement. Right. Right. And so if I'm not engaged, engagement or attention, whatever you want to call it, is primary because if you don't have that, and I'm going to get fancy here, you can't go beyond time and space. Mm. And the whole idea of a wonderful story is to go beyond time and space. Oh my God, I can't believe I sat down and read the whole book in, in two hours. Or I've been reading this book for four hours and I can't believe it's already midnight. Yeah. Oh my God, this two hour movie is over already. I thought I felt like I just sat down. Yeah. That's going beyond time and space, which actually makes the artist the alchemist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, so much good stuff. <laughs> All right. I feel like this is, that's such a great point to wrap up this particular conversation that what you said about the artist becoming the alchemist. And I think that's, that's what we're talking about here as how do we do that and do that well and effectively? Yeah, well, one of the ways that we can do that is by working with you or someone of your sense and sensibility and groundedness and still have a high sense of awareness of creating this. Because in today's world, more people are going to enjoy your book through an audio experience than they are in sitting down and reading it. Right. The stats are true. Yeah. And so 
in a way, to be a writer today is to be an audio storyteller. Mm. That line is blurring every day more. Yeah. And different sense and sensibilities come up with that. And one of the things that I feel like, and I'm sure you advocate it for as well, is that earlier on, the author needs to have a chapter read out loud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I, do you feel I like think that's it's really helpful? Really helpful. Yeah. Because you, similar in some ways to that you can catch so many things that are not working, anything from typos, grammatical errors, punctuation, whatever, all of those things become much more, they show up much more when you actually Mm -hmm. start reading aloud. So some of that is really just an editing thing that can happen. But the other is being able to hear that dialogue like you were talking about, you know, being able to hear it back and then we can respond to it in a more, well, let me put it this way. If we have two characters in a scene talking to each other and we're reading the text, we're creating that idea in our minds of people saying it out loud. Let's hear it out loud and find out, well, does it really play like that? And I think many times when we're narrating a piece of fiction, let's say, we'll head into some dialogue and keep stumbling over a line. Well, the reason we're stumbling over the line is because it's not written in a way that someone would naturally say it most often. Now, on one hand, that could be the case. And on the other hand, it could be that the narrator hasn't fully connected with those particular war words in that particular order. And so that's a question that needs to be, would need to be evaluated. But let's say you've got a character and the dialogue is flowing and it is working and then you get to this one sentence and they just you're stumbling all over yourself trying to get it Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. as it's written it can be an indicator yeah but just the idea of being able to actually hear out loud dialogue spoken out loud to evaluate it makes a lot of sense i like what you just said out loud dialogue is actually read out loud yeah because yes because then it falls to your ear in a different way yeah that's not what i was thinking yeah well Here we are now. (laughs) So I feel like getting authors to open up to having that experience sooner in their process only be beneficial. Yeah. There's no downside. Yeah, totally agree. And uh, honestly, because I've had people say, I've had authors tell me that they mm -hmm. will do this, but they'll have AI read it back to them. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 no. That's different. Uh huh. <laughs> it's hysterical, right? The very person who's AI is going to take over the world. It's horrible. Oh, wait a minute. Let me use it. Yeah. So, in a down and dirty world where you're just wanting to do something of that ilk, absolutely sure. Why not? But if you really like, okay. And so, my process around this is that you assign roles and you have the narrator and if there's description that's outside of the narrator then someone else reads that there's going to be a couple of people right yeah. in the room yeah and then literally you assemble the people and then maybe even some people to listen with you so you're not locked in just to your perspective mm-hmm. and then you sit in the back of the room so you don't get any input from anyone else close your eyes and go for the ride yeah that's valuable because this thing of having AI or having a friend read it to you on the fly, mm-hmm. that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about listening to a whole chapter yeah. and let it wash over you. Yeah. Make notes if needed. Right. Isn't, that's yep. what we're really talking about. That's what we're talking about. Yep. As I just want to make sure yeah. that people hear this and go, oh, good idea. Yeah. No, it's just it had reminded me when you said that about that I've had people say, oh, yeah, well, I just use a reader to read it back to me so I can I think, wait a minute. <laughs> there's some problems hey. there <laughs> that's fun that's fun okay well i know our yeah. time goes by so fast i know and yeah but next time we come together i would like to for us to have a conversation around writers and their breathing mm. and voiceover talent and their breathing oh i love that we'll do that we'll do that soon Breathing is so foundational and none of us breathe enough. So I really want to open that door next time. Beautiful. Beautiful. Joshua Townsend, thank you so much for being with us today. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Blessings. 
Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.